Well, um, I appreciate Ashley's great talk. This, you might think of this as the part two of Ashley's talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about similar issues. Um, as soon as I figure this, there we go. Okay. Um, vegetation type conversion is certainly an overriding theme of what I'm going to be talking about. There's a number of studies in the past that have uh, addressed uh, vegetation type conversion as being a function of fire frequency, as Ashley was referring to. This is just an illustration here of a site where you see on the right-hand side three fires in a row, and we've converted chaparral into uh, invasive uh, grasses. A number of people have addressed this issue in the past. Um, Paul Zedler, Anna Jacobson, uh, Alex Seifert, Brandon Pratt. Um, but uh, related to this is the uh, fact that not all studies have necessarily shown fire as a primary driver. For example, there are a number of labs where uh, studies have suggested that maybe other factors are driving vegetation type conversion. And so I'm addressing essentially the hypothesis that the impact of short fire intervals is a function of species composition. In other words, a function of the functional types that are in chaparral changes the outcome of fire impacts on chaparral. Uh, don't need to go over this much. Already Ashley has covered uh, functional types, obligate re-sprouters, uh, facultative re-sprouter cedars. Uh, the group that I'm going to mostly focus on today is uh, obligate cedars, and these are species that um, do not re-sprout after a fire. They're entirely dependent on accumulating a seed bank. And this uh, faculty, or this type is common in the genus Ceanothus. We have over 60 species in the state, uh, and the same with Arctostaphylus. A lot of those species are obligate cedars. I haven't quite figured out where I'm supposed to point this. Oh, OK. Um, Important thing uh, related to what I'm going to talk about today is the diversity of different functional types in chaparral. And the point that's uh, particularly worth noting is obligate cedars comprise about 70% of all the shrub species in chaparral. So it's a, in terms of biodiversity, it's an extremely uh, important part of our uh, chaparral flora. Now, the, uh, between fires, um, Obligate cedars have to accumulate a sufficient seed bank uh, in the soil. And if there are short intervals between fires, uh, some species may not uh, accumulate sufficient seeds to regenerate. The question I'm addressing here is, how short is too short? Uh, in the literature, it's often suggested eight years is maybe too short, but other people have suggested other intervals. Uh, in general, if we're concerned about biodiversity in chaparral, we need to understand this issue. Uh, because it's critical in this day and age where we're thinking uh, a lot about mitigation strategies such as prescription burning. We need to have some idea of the appropriate prescriptions uh, to avoid biodiversity loss. Now, the uh, problem in terms of trying to address the composition of chaparral in different studies is most of them have been done with uh, remote sensing. This includes much of the work that Alex Seifert and I have done. Uh, and one of the problems associated with remote sensing techniques is it's hard to get much information on species composition. And so what I started several years ago was a field project where I traveled around the state uh, and visited about 45 different counties looking at something around 65 different fires that occurred between 20, 21, 22, and evaluated the age of the stand prior to the fire to see what the impact was on recover of different functional uh, types. The, an illustration of the approach that was used is uh, evident here with uh, one of the fires, one of the first fires we looked at. It was the, in San Diego County, the Valley Fire, which is this purple outline here, and it overlapped with the 2006 Horse Fire. And so the, uh, there was uh, essentially
Is that an indication I spoke too long? <laughs> Sorry about that. Technical difficulty. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, is illustrated by this figure here is it's a fire history map. The valley fire, the purple outline, um, overlapped with the 2006 horse fire. And so we have spans of different ages, 50 years uh, in uh, much of the valley fire because it overlapped with the 1970 Laguna fire. And then in the overlap zone with the horse fire, we had a 14 year interval. And so that described more or less our approach was to find different intervals between fires and evaluate what the impact was on recovery. I think I'm going to have to have you, Nicole, come up and <laughs> change this for me. You can use the arrows in the bottom right of the keyboard too if you want. Okay. Maybe we'll go here, John, to these arrows. Okay, I'll give that a try. Okay. Um, now, the primary metric that we're looking at in this study is to uh, answer the question is, under different intervals between fires, what is the extent to which we see replacement level recruitment. By place, replacement level recruitment, we mean the extent to which seedlings in these obligate cedars are likely to re replace the pre-fire population. And the metric we used was to look at the uh, density of the skeletons, which is an indication of pre-fire population size, and compare that, uh, the number of seedlings per uh, adult uh, skeleton. In general, you have to have at least one to have replacement level, but probably one is not even going to be sufficient because oftentimes we see extensive thinning of the vegetation. And this is illustrated in an earlier study where we looked at seedling survivorship after fire up to five years. And one of the things you notice is even though you know what the recruitment is in the first year, it doesn't necessarily mean that's how many seedlings you're going to have uh, through succession. In other words, there's thinning, and so one is the bare minimum you'd have to have for replacement. Probably you need more than uh, one seedling per skeleton to replace that population. Uh, an illustration of what we saw in the Valley Fire, uh, we have um, two obligate cedars, Ceanothus arctostaphylus, a facultative cedar and an obligate, excuse me, a facultative re-sprouter and an obligate re-sprouter. And I'll talk about the re-sprouters at the end, but let's focus just on the cedars. And one of the things that you'll notice, okay, to the speakers yesterday, it wasn't me. I guess you only get three points. There's also, this does work. It does. Well, I suppose there's it's, always. It's very faint. You see it? Oh, it is very it's, faint. It's here. It's there? This one. Yeah, that one. OK. Um, OK, now I need to go back. Just hit the arrow button that goes back to the left. And oh, OK. Right, uh, down here. You guys have, this should do it, right? Hit this guy. Yeah. Is that the one you want to go back to nope. more? Back. OK. OK, so just, that's back that before. OK. Um, you'd think this is the first talk I ever gave. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things to point out is we're looking in this uh, Valley Fire incident. Uh, we're comparing mature stand, 50 years of age since the last fire versus uh, immature 14-year-old stand. One of the things to notice is seedling recruitment per pre-fire skeleton is about an order of magnitude lower, in, uh, certainly in the Arctostaphylus, and substantially lower in the Ceanothus uh, uh, individuals here. Um, so that suggests that certainly there's some reason to be concerned about the maturity of the stand at the time of the fire. Another example, this is from Santa Clara uh, uh, County. The uh, San, Santa Clara complex fire from 2020 is the red perimeter. It overlapped with the 2007 Lick fire, and so we were able to look at the recruitment in the mature versus immature. And once again, we see the same pattern. Pretty significant recruitment, and the older stands, about an order of magnitude 
uh, less recruitment in the immature span. And we see the same thing with ceanothus. In other words, here we have a 13-year span, and there's reason to be concerned about the level of recruitment in this obligate cedar. Um, one other uh, area in this uh, lick fire, or not the lick fire, the um, Santa Clara complex fire is it overlapped at one area with a fire that last occurred in, uh, in uh, 1910. In other words, it was an 86-year-old, or excuse me, a 96-year-old stand. And here we see in these older stands substantial recruitment. In other words, no evidence of senescence risk, but there's definitely evidence of immaturity risk. Another example, this is from Monterey County. This is the Dolan Fire from 2020 that overlapped with the Indian Fire uh, from uh, 2008. And we see a similar sort of pattern. Uh, substantial, about an order of magnitude, drop in recruitment uh, in uh, the obligate cedars in this 12-year-old stand. We see the same sort of thing in a lot of different areas. This is going back south to Orange County. And in Orange County, we had this 2020 uh, bonfire, which is the red outline, overlapped with the 2007 Santiago fire. Much of that landscape was dominated by these white-flowered ceanothus, ceanothus uh, crassifolius. And <clears throat> if you look in the areas that were mature at the time of the bonfire, we have substantial seedlings uh, per uh, pre-fire shrub, nine in this case, we had zero seedlings. So in other words, in this site, even though we had substantial uh, pre-fire shrubs, we had, uh, the species was extirpated with a 13-year interval. Uh, we've seen this repeatedly in a lot of different fires. These are fires that we've looked at, some of the fires we've looked at, and we see, for example, stands that are 12, 11, 15 years of age, 11 years of age, and zero recruitment. In other words, we have a lot of evidence that species can be extirpated if the uh, uh, age of the stand at the time of the fire is uh, relatively low. And we see this particularly in Arctostaphylus. Many of them require fairly long periods before we see substantial recruitment. This is the North Complex fire in Plumas County, uh, one seedling per uh, pre-fire skeleton in a 25-year-old stand. Just to sort of summarize, what we see in a lot of these species is no evidence of senescence risk. These species can exist a long time and still come back, even if the stand is quite old. Here we have 50, 60-year-old stands, and they're doing just fine in terms of post-fire recruitment. Stands of Ceanothus less than 20 years of age are potentially threatened, uh, and uh, with Arctostaphylus, the same sort of uh, thing, about 20 to 25 uh, years. Now, we also see this with a number of serotonous conifers. In many ways, they're like an obligate seeding chaparral shrub. They only recruit uh, after fire. This is uh, Tecati cypress. This is a mature stand that burned, and you can see the massive seedling recruitment after fire. But nearby stands, only seven years of age at the time of the fire, zero recruitment. So it's a, a concern in serotonous conifers. And here's one very unfortunate case. This is from Plumas County. This is a uh, Baker cypress, a rare and endangered species. And it burned in the uh, Dixie Fire in 2021, overlapped with uh, the 2007 Moonlight Fire. And we had massive saplings, burned up saplings uh, in the stand, but zero seedlings. In other words, that species was extirpated from the site, uh, even though it was 14 years of age. So to sort of summarize, um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is balancing hazard reduction and resource protection is a very wicked problem. Unlike forest, where we can uh, both uh, benefit hazard reduction and resource conservation by short intervals, uh, it's not so simple in shrublets. Short intervals necessary for fire hazard reduction may result in resource sacrifice and depletion of biodiversity. Uh, now, lastly, I might just point out, although short interval fires are a threat to biodiversity in chaparral, uh, it depends on the composition as to whether or not <coughs> it leads to type conversion. 
for example. I haven't said much about the resprouting shrubs, but the resprouting shrubs uh, we found pretty good return through resprouting at relatively young ages. These are different obligate resprouters here and uh, stands nine to ten years of age, we get 100% resprouted. So in other words, if you have a stand dominated by resprouters, it does not necessarily uh, lead to type conversion if you have uh, short interval fires. Chemise very uh, across the board. We have stands at four years of age, which uh, may be <coughs> anywhere from 48 to 100% uh, resprouting after fire. So, it uh, depends a great deal on what the composition is. And one of the things to recognize is that when it comes to prescription burning, we need to consider community composition. And stand aid should play a role in prescription design. Um, however, restricting prescription burning to mature stands is not necessarily a guarantee uh, against resource loss. For example, this is an area in Kern County, the French Fire, and the French Fire, uh, the older mature stands were uh, something on the order of like 55 years of age, massive recruitment of Ceanothus, 18-year-old stand, no recruitment at all. But that stand was 18 years of age because it was in the middle of this prescribed burned area. So in other words, by putting fire on the ground, you also potentially threaten the return of certain species uh, when a wildfire comes through. And we've seen the same thing with, um, oh, thanks, Gray. He's going to come up and help me finish. <laughs> we see the same thing in the CZU fire. This is an illustration of several uh, knobcone pine stands in the CZU, different ages here, 47 down to 26. And we see in the 26-year-old stand, uh, very little recruitment of the knobcone pine. In other words, it's threatened with replacement level. And if one looks at the uh, prescription burn map for uh, <coughs> Big Basin, where this was occurred, 1994, which this site was right in the middle of 1994 prescription burn, in other words, there was a prescription burn done in 1994, and it was probably done in a mature stand, had no obvious impact. However, it created a case where that species was potentially threatened when a wildfire came through too soon. So we have to recognize that just putting fire on the ground can be a resource threat to chaparral if you're concerned about biodiversity issues. Thank you.